What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and in today's video I'm going to be building a Ryzen 5000 based RTX 3080 gaming PC build. I've got a load of great components including this Zen 3 compatible B450 motherboard as well as a really good value M.2 drive. I'm going to run you through all the parts, take you over the build process step by step so you can follow along if you like including all the fiddly wires and cables before booting this machine up and seeing how it performs a little bit later. Without any further ado though, let's jump into it. As always, I'm going to kick things off by installing the CPU and the RAM and the M.2 drive into the motherboard choice today. As I alluded to earlier, this is a brand new motherboard from Asus. It's the successor to their B450 ROG Strix board, but it's got Ryzen Gen 3 aka Ryzen 5000 series support. I'm just going to pop it on top of our motherboard box today so we can then go ahead and install the CPU. This is the new Ryzen 5 5600X and I've got to give a huge shout out to eBuyer who've managed to send me a Ryzen 5000 CPU for videos like this so a big shout out to them. All their links will be down below. There's good reason as to why I wanted hands-on with this chip. It annihilates the current i5 options, isn't going to bottleneck our 3080 at 1080p as we'll see later, and with fast clock speed, 6 cores and 12 threads, it does everything that you've come to know and love from a Ryzen 5 CPU. Installing it's pretty easy, we're just going to pull up this retention arm on our CPU socket and line up the triangle here on our processor with the corresponding triangle. That's just going to drop in nice and easily to place before we pop our arm back down. It is a little bit more pricey than I would have liked, but this affordable, great value Asus motherboard should help offset some of the cost difference today. I'm next up going to pop in our M.2 drive today. This is the Seagate Barracuda 510. It's available in either 512 or 1 terabyte capacities. There's enough budget in this build uh, for a 1 terabyte drive. Now, in order to do this, we just need to make sure there's a standoff installed here. If there isn't, you can find this in your motherboard's box. Our drive today is then just going to slide into the M.2 slot and secure down with a teeny tiny little screwdriver. Right then, the final thing to install into the motherboard today is our RAM. This is a kit of 16 gigabyte team group T-Force Delta RGB. Installing it's pretty easy. We're just going to line the notch on our RAM dim with the corresponding notch on our RAM dim slots. Pull back the clips on the second and fourth slots and then pretty easily slide our RAM into place today. Repeat for as many dims as you've got and just like that the motherboard assembly is now pretty much complete. Actually I tell a lie. I think it's probably a good idea to install the CPU cooler before we put it in the case. It doesn't make a whole load of difference but it should be easier to show you guys watching at home. Now to do this today we first want to just take off the fan that comes included on the cooler and then take the pre-included plastic back plate. Uh, with Intel facing towards the bottom of the motherboard and AMD facing away from the motherboard we're just going to make sure that we've got a standoff in each corner just like so. If you're a bit confused, don't panic. Refer to the manual, which is always the case with the CPU cooler because they're all so unique from one and other. We also need to make sure that we have removed the included two plastic brackets as well because we're not going to need these. We're then just going to take the back plate and thread it under the back of our motherboard. We should then see four silver standoffs protrude through the board itself and we're going to use these screws today to actually screw onto those standoffs and make sure our back plate doesn't go anywhere. It's also really important that you just pop a little bit of thermal paste on your CPU. That's going to be more than enough today as that is going to form a conductive layer between the cooler and the processor. We're then just going to screw down corner by corner. It makes sense to go in a little bit of a cross pattern to keep things as even as possible. We're going to pop the fan back on a little bit later to make sure it's nice and easy to screw into our case today. Talking of which, this right here is the chassis we're going to going to be using. It's from Aerocool, it's their new mecha case. It's really great value and has RGB, which is very important here 
on the GeekerWatt channel. This is actually quite a compact case today, meaning the build should look pretty well proportioned. And with a tempered glass side panel, it's got pretty much all the features we want today, but at a budget price point. The best thing to do with any case is to take off both the side panels to make everything that bit easier to work with. If we spin it round at the rear here, you'll also find uh, a bag of included screws and accessories, which we're going to use today to install the motherboard really nicely into place. By default, this case comes with the standoffs pre-installed for a micro ATX motherboard, which means we just need to add a couple in here, 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 and here. And there we have it. The motherboard is now nicely screwed into place. I did have to just briefly remove our fan today because it was all a little bit tight. So I'm just gonna go ahead and reinstall this and then we're ready to go. Now then, all that's really left to install is our graphics card and the power supply today. I'm gonna do the GPU in just a second's time because I know many of you are going to just skip this bit anyway. This is the Antec 750 watt Earthwatts Gold Pro power supply. The PSU itself is white but the cables are black which is going to blend in quite nicely for the build today. It is semi-modular too which should keep our cable clutter to a minimum today. Pre-installed it's got a 24 pin motherboard power cable, a dual 6 plus 2 pin PCIe power connector as well as dual 4 plus 4 pin CPU power cables. I'm also going to pop in uh, a singular SATA power harness for any RGB fan or strip controllers but because we've got no other drives today that's really pretty much it. This just pops into the semi-modular interface a little something like that before the power supply screws into the case today. Unfortunately this case doesn't have a power supply shroud but I was trying to keep things under budget today and this case really ticked every other box, including uh, the tempered glass side panel. We're gonna install those power cables now as well, alongside some of our front panel headers. The four plus four pin CPU power connector is first up, and that goes to the top left of the motherboard, just like so. The 24 pin motherboard power cable is next up, it's the largest of the bunch, and goes to the right hand side of the motherboard today. Our HD audio connector is next, uh, that makes the headphone and mic jacks on our case work today. With a pin blocked out, it only goes in one way around and heads down to the bottom left of the motherboard. JFP1 aka our power reset hard drive indicator LED front panel cables are next and these go to the bottom right corner of the motherboard. They are a bit fiddly so take your time and I'll pop a diagram on screen now to kind of help you out. Finally then the last of those cables is our USB 3 today. This powers the USB 3 ports on our case and is notched so we'll only go in one way around. Okay then with the cables out the way today, the next thing we're going to do is install the graphics card. This is the RTX 3080. Specifically, it's the Asus TUF version. Now, yes, I will be covering the new Ryzen 6000 GPUs when they launch, so make sure you get subscribed for that if you aren't already. But there is no denying that at the minute, this 3080 is basically, I think, the best card that you can buy. Yes, the 3090 and 6900 XT have more raw performance, but for the price point, this thing's pretty incredible and I really do hope AMD come close but until the benchmarks are out who knows. Now to install our graphics card today we just need to remove the second and third PCIe slot covers by removing this screw here before pushing back the clip on our PCIe slot today and sliding the GPU and this is going to be tight into place. There is no way. Look how tight that is. I mean, it actually is going to look really awesome when the build's all done because it's going to be quite nicely proportioned. But I'd be lying if I said my heart didn't stop for a second there. <laughs> Oh my god. We're gonna then secure the graphics card down into place. We're then just gonna go ahead and make sure it's all nicely plugged and powered up today. And there we have it. That looks pretty awesome. All that's left to do then is to just do a little bit of cable management, whack those side panels on, and then boot this machine up to see how it performs in a load. And I mean a load of the most popular titles. First though, let's see just how good it looks when it's all powered up. And there's only one way to do that. Roll the montage. Alright 
then, now we've put this system together and seen just how good it looks when it's all powered up, let's dive in and see exactly how it performs. I've tested a wide range of titles today to give you a really even picture. Death Stranding is first up at 4K high settings with Nvidia's DLSS technology on, and here we're seeing 121 FPS on average, with 110 and 103 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. GTA 5 was a game that I tested at two resolutions today. First up was 4K at high settings, and here you see in 75 FPS on average, with 68 and 66 for the 90 and 99th percentile results, showing just how difficult of a game GTA 5 still can be to run at higher resolutions. Thankfully, the frame rates at 1440p were a good chunk higher, and on high settings, once again, we're getting 102 FPS on average, with 90 and 75 frames per second for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Control is another good example of RTX and DLSS today. 4K medium settings with DLSS enabled uh, gave us 72 FPS on average, with 90 and 99th percentile results of 69 and 63, meaning the game pretty much always stayed above 63 FPS or higher, which is really quite impressive for 4K medium to high settings. Apex Legends looked pretty good as normal, 4K pretty much maxed out across the board, so I'm really digging the new season of Apex. Call of Duty's Warzone also performed pretty well today, 4K high settings gives us 99 FPS on average, with 89 and 75 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. You could easily hit 120, 130 FPS uh, if you wanted to at 4K, and similarly 1440p is going to give you 150, 160 plus, and that's before you've dialed down any of the settings. Forza Horizon 4 is next up today, not quite so popular as some of the other titles, but it still performs really well. 4K on the Ultra preset gives you 131 FPS on average, with 121 and 116 uh, for those secondary and third results. Uh, this was in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, so if you'd like to go back and compare this system to my others, you can do so really easily. Talking of which, Overwatch is next up. I test this in every single video, and here at 4K Ultra settings, you're looking 226 FPS. Need I say any more, and the fact that the game never really went below 196 frames per second is also mightily impressive at 4K Ultra settings. CSGO Counter-Strike Global Offensive, the easiest game on my list today to run, but still really, really popular. 290 frames per second at 4K high settings, and you really can't go too far wrong. Battlefield 5 is a much more demanding game to run than CSGO though, and here at 4K high settings, with RTX off and DLSS on, saw 85 FPS on average, with 68 and 56. Make sure you turn VSync off when you play Battlefield 5, it has a huge performance impact, but these numbers are pretty impressive at 4K pretty much maxed out settings. Talking of maxed out settings, Doom Eternal is next on my list today, at the 4K Ultra Nightmare preset. Yes, the preset's really called Ultra Nightmare. You look in 140 frames per second on average with 114 and 102 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. Rainbow Six Siege is next up today here at 4K. You look in 120 FPS on completely maxed out settings on average with 90 and 99th percentile results of 111 and 105. If you tune down to 1440p, you'll very easily be able to get 2 to 50 FPS, but the nature of maxed out settings does have a performance hit, inevitably. Valorant then is the penultimate game on my list today. It's in a similar league to CSGO in terms of how difficult or easy it is to run, and it's a very well optimised game. 4K high settings sees 321 FPS on average, with 90 and 99th percentile results in the region of 284 and 245. That is utterly insane. Finally then, the last game on my list today is Fortnite. I tested it at two different settings variations. First off, 4K with RTX disabled and Nvidia's DLSS technology enabled, which renders the game out at a slightly lower resolution, uses AI to upscale, giving you that extra frames per second. 250 frames per second on average with 192 and 156 is mightily impressive, and the game looked pretty great. Fortnite at 1440p with RTX 
on uh, is going to yield you around about 100 fps on average which is significantly lower ray tracing does have a fairly significant performance hit in fortnite but they're still nearly triple figure frame rates at 1440p pretty much everything on high or ultra settings which is kind of insane. With that being said though, that pretty much wraps it up for not only all the gaming benchmarks today, but the whole video. If you did enjoy it, give it a big old like rating, get subscribed, and as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.